Good morning, church. Good morning. As we continue into our service, as we open God's word further, will you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word that contains such hope, that tells it like it is, that apart from you there is no life. But Father, with you there is the hope of life eternal, happiness and joy now that lasts forever. Father, would you please bless us as we open your word today? We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know how many of you could use a little extra hope in your world. As you are going through life, it's not exactly easy, is it? Every single month, every single day reminds us that there are things that we could really use help with. Today, I want to bring you a message of hope from the book of Ezekiel. It might not be something that you typically associate with hope, but I hope, we're going to use that word a lot, I guess. I hope that as we explore this text together, that you see that what is impossible for man is possible for God. Because just maybe in some of your lives, there are some impossible things happening. And on this day, this Sabbath day, whether you're here in person or watching online, maybe you need the reminder that the hope that you need is in God. That what you're trying to achieve, He can help you achieve. So, let's explore the book of Ezekiel from dry bones to vibrant life with Jesus. When I was a boy, we lived next to a river, Rose Valley. Uh, my grandfather said it was called Shanghai Valley once upon a time because if you fell asleep somewhere in that valley, you were going to wake up on a ship, a timber ship headed for parts unknown, the Orient. We proceed, yeah, we proceed to call it Rose Valley when I was a boy because of all of the, the flowers in the area and how beautiful it was. But that river has the Cowieman River that runs right through it. I grew up on that river. And at high water, you can't even hope to cross that river. So to get to Grandma's house, in our case, is a half mile down to the county bridge, cross the county bridge, a half mile back on a gravel road. But at the summer, bright, sunny time of year, the water level started to drop. And pretty soon they would drop far enough where you could see in the river that if you could get to that rock and then that rock and then that rock, you didn't have to walk a mile to get to grandma's house. You could go across the river. But when you're a little kid, how tall are your legs? How long are your legs? And what looks to be a really short distance, you find out very quickly ends with a very wet kid. Because when you're trying to jump from rock top to rock top and bedrock to bedrock and across, nah, little legs just don't make it. But I'll tell you what did matter. I happen to know two people with longer legs than mine. Mom and dad. And the relationship made the difference because both of their legs were just long enough so that if they held my hand, if I held their hand, I could get partway through the jump, and then guess what they do? They're the superpower, right? They swing you to the next rock, or their legs are already on the next rock, and they bring you through on the rest of that journey. So step by step, with mom and dad's help, you could cross the middle of the river. Something impossible for you by yourself, but with the help of somebody whose legs were a little longer and whose arms were a little stronger, you could get across. Today, I want to talk to you about a situation in which we need a relationship with somebody whose legs proverbially are a little longer than ours. The rivers that we need to cross, the problems that we face are such nature that we need God to help us get through them. I want to remind us of this from an account in the book of Ezekiel. And Ezekiel, if if you don't remember, we'll start with the context. We're talking some 600 years nearly before Jesus. So from our day to that day, that's almost 2,600 years, so a little bit before you and I were here. The political climate is not good at this time when Ezekiel is writing. The children of Israel, the descendants of Israel, who covenanted to follow the Creator God have begun to follow other gods. They begin to worship other idols. They have, they have begun to choose false gods instead of the true God, and God has sent them messenger after messenger saying, look, if, when you leave me, you leave your source of life. When you leave me, you leave your protection from the might makes right power over world. 
And when you leave me, you are vulnerable. With me, you're invulnerable. But apart from me, you're in a very risky, dangerous place. So in spite of all of the messages sent to them, please re-enter this covenantal relationship based on love with me, they've said, no, we prefer to look like the world around us. And God, being the gentleman that he is, has said, okay, I'm not going to twist your arm to follow me. I will step away, and you can have what you wish. But what begins to happen, even though they're worshiping these false gods which they believe are superior to the true God, then their enemies surround them. They begin to be deported. Daniel is part of that first wave that gets deported to Babylon. Ezekiel ends up in Babylonian captivity, and as he's writing this book, the city of Jerusalem falls. And she's fallen because she ignored the invitation to return to a loving relationship with her heavenly father. Prophet after prophet, messenger after messenger, rejected. So what is Ezekiel to think? What are his people to think when, because of their own actions, they are now reaping the consequences of leaving their protection and their source of life? What are they to think? Will God accept us back? Does, is there a hope and a future for us? If we rejected him, is he now going to reject us? And God steps into Ezekiel's life with a message for the people of his day and thankfully for ours. Listen to this. If you want to join me in your paper Bible or your pew Bible, Ezekiel chapter 37, starting with verse 1, we're only going to read 14 verses. We're going to go through this little tiny vision because in this vision, God communicates hope both to Ezekiel and to us 2,600 years later. So Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 1, the hand of the Lord came upon me and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and he set me down in the midst of the valley it was full of bones. I don't know how many of you would have a problem with that. Not too many of us have ever stood where a battle was fought and there were so many slain that there was no one left to bury anyone. But this is the case. Jerusalem has fallen. Their armies are devastated. And God is taking Ezekiel in vision to a place where there's nobody left to even bury the dead. Then he caused me to pass by them all around, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and indeed they were very dry. There's nothing left but bones. Time has passed, and nobody has come to bury these people. The animals have come, the sun has done its work, nature has done its work, and all that's left are bones across the valley. He, God, said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? Now, I like Ezekiel's answer. Ezekiel doesn't go for yes or no, right? Ezekiel, you could say, well, yes, they could, that, or no, they couldn't. Ezekiel totally does the smart thing. Oh, Lord God, you know, right? He gives it right back to God. You know the answer to this question. When you and I look at a set of bones, dry bones, and there's nothing left, and if someone were to ask us, can this can these live again? Our answer today in the 21st, 20, yeah, we're in 2022. Let me get myself located in time. In our day of forensics and science, of course, we look at that and say, no, they're done. The stuff that is necessary for life isn't there anymore. Oh, Lord God, the wise answer, you know. Again, he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin and put breath in you. You shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. That's impressive. God is telling him to speak as if something is going to happen, to speak a word prophetically. Nothing has been seen yet. They're still just bones and yet God tells him to speak as if the bones are listening. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise and suddenly a rattling. And the bones came together bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them. The skin covered them over. But there was no breath in them. So what was a valley of dry bones? What was a problem impossible 
to mankind has now taken a, a miraculous step toward this impossible. The bones are no longer bones, they're, they're inanimate bodies. The muscle is there, the tendons are there, the tissue is there, but the spirit, the life is missing. Yeah, also, he said to me, verse 9, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. Now, if you're Ezekiel, and you had started by looking at a valley of dry bones, and God asked you to prophesy and speak to the bones, and something amazing happened, emotionally, how do you think he's thinking now when God tells him to prophesy a second time? to speak a word and make the next step happen. He's already seen step by step dry bones to people, but they're not alive yet. They need a little CPR. They need a little spark of life. They need the breath of God. Do you think he was excited to speak again on God's behalf? <laughs> so I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet and exceedingly great army. Do you think at the start of this vision, he would have expected that like four sentences later, all of the dry bones are going to be living and breathing and healthy people? No. When you and I look at the dry bones in our own life, these problems that we face, these, these things that we think are dead and beyond hope, I think Ezekiel thinks the same way we did. No, that's, they're dead, God. But I hope that this text starts to remind us and gives us, plants the seed of an idea in our mind that where we find impossibility for the Creator God, nothing's impossible. Those things that you're facing, those things that seem like there's absolutely no hope of saving or solving or fixing or restoring, ah, you're related to God. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. Jerusalem has just fallen. The armies have been defeated. The Babylonians have taken over. The people have been deported. They're no longer in their homeland. And yet here's God saying, Son of man, I have heard you. I'm listening. I know the problems you're facing. I know the size of the things that are troubling your heart. And I want to address them for you. So he's quoting what he's hearing. The prayers that go up day by day from the people. Your prayers that go up day by day. God's still listening. Therefore prophesy and say to them. So Ezekiel has been told to prophesy to the bones. Then he's been told to prophesy to the breath. And now he's being told now go prophesy to the people. Yes. Therefore prophesy and say to them. Thus says the Lord God. Behold O my people. Who's God talking to? My people. Whoever chooses Him. There's a relationship here that makes the difference. He's not prophesying. He's not out there just talking to people who don't want that covenant relationship. He's talking to the people. Oh, my people. The ones who call me Father. The ones who call me God. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, oh, my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. This is interesting because Ezekiel is in captivity. The people are in captivity. They have lost loved ones in this military campaign. They are deported and their nation has been shattered to the dust. And to that, God says, I have a God-sized solution. I've got something that for you is impossible, but not for me. I speak worlds into existence. I can certainly bring you back. Then you shall know, he says, that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves. This is the third time he said that. This is his hallmark. I'll bring you up from the graves. I'll bring you back from the graves. And when I do so, you will know that I'm the Lord. All those false gods that you've just started following that got you into this trouble, all those ones that you thought could save you from your enemies but have really let you down? No, when I bring you up from the grave, you'll know that I'm God, not them. I will put my spirit in you, you shall live. I will place you in your own land. 
two things here, to bring you back from the grave and to bring you back to your land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. So Ezekiel, troubled at the fall of Jerusalem, disheartened by the fall of his nation, the nation who knew better, the nation who had stood at the base of Mount Sinai with the mixed multitude and had God invite them. If you, if you want to be my people, I want to be your God. But here's how we do this. Here's, here's how you love your fellow man and here's how you love God. If you want to do that, let's enter into a covenant relationship. To that people who left him, God says, I'm not leaving you. You may have chosen another God, but, but you're still my people. So what are we talking about? First of all, we are talking about the restoration of life to God's people. Now, it's interesting here because when you look at some of the commentaries and things on this, they will focus on the fact that there is a restoration of the national identity here, but when you look closely at the text, that's not what it says. It says, I will bring you up from the grave. I will bring you up from the grave. I will bring you up from the grave. That's step one. A restoration of life that has been taken. The Creator God taking us all the way back to Genesis 1 and 2 to say, I can create from nothing. I can certainly recreate when I wish to. So Ezekiel, this vision of these dry bones that come together from dry bones to muscles to skin to the breath of life to a mighty army. God saying, I'm the one who gives life and can restore life. The second thing we're talking about is the restoration of God's people to his promised land, to the land he promised them. A land flowing with milk and honey, a land of peace where... If they were to follow him, their children would grow up without threat. Their grandchildren could laugh and it would be a place of delight and happiness forever if they stayed in covenant relationship with him. So the two promises here that are very clearly spoken about, a restoration of life that has been taken and a restoration to a country that has been taken. And the third thing, the metaphorical reminder If God is capable of restoring life to dead bones and taking you out of your enemy's clutches and restoring you to a place of safety, then, from very real enemies, what can he do today for your problems and mine? What can he do for the things that have been stolen from us? What can he do for the things that are broken, that look like dry bones, that have had all the life sucked out of them in our lives? observations. First of all, the bones were in plain sight. There was no denying what the problem was. There was an army here, or there was a group of people here. There's nothing left but bones. In your life and mine, the issues that we face, the issues where the life has been sucked out of them are in plain sight. You know what they are. You know the things that you don't talk to anybody but God about, the things that you wish had life brought back to them but you have no idea how to do it. They're in plain sight. And the plain answer, the clear answer, as Ezekiel is seeing it, is, wait, I just have to get the God who creates and recreates into this problem set. And when I, when I get into that relationship with that God, the problem that I'm facing is no longer impossible. It's possible. God is with Ezekiel in the valley. Ezekiel says, he led me, he showed me, he he basically walked with me through the bones. Take a look at this, look at that, look at this. Friends, I don't know what your valley is, but God's with you in it, just like he was with Ezekiel. Right? Whatever those bones are that are lying in plain sight, God is there and he's waiting for you to speak that prophetic word. To, To give him permission, to partner with him to solve that issue. God is with him. God is with us. What is absolutely impossible for Ezekiel is absolutely possible for God. Genesis 2. When's the last time you ever went out and, well, okay, I took a uh, a lemon from Publix a couple months ago. And what do you do normally? You squeeze the lemon juice out or you put it on whatever you're baking and then you throw it away. Well, I thought, what if I take the seeds out first? This was an experiment. This is what I do in my free time. I took all the seeds out of the lemon. I thought, what if I put them in potting soil? Can you actually grow a lemon tree from your Publix, you know, your lemon? 
Well, sure enough, I now have probably 15 trees that I will never be able to all grow. Pot them in the potting soil, sprinkle them, sprinkle them with water, set them out in the sunlight, and a few weeks later, it's bright green. They're about three inches tall now. I don't know what I'm going to do with them. If anybody needs a lemon tree, let me know, right? But the God who started in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, and he scoops together a bunch of dust, and he gets his hands dirty, and he leans down, and he breathes into it, and Adam opens his eyes, and God's face is like right there, right? If you're going to breathe a breath into something, it's pretty close. The same God that creates in the beginning can recreate. There is no problem that you face that is bigger than the the God of creation. So Ezekiel's people are devastated and his heart is broken and shattered and their hopes and dreams have disappeared for their people, their country, their nation, their lives. And God is saying, I got you. I got this. Stay close to me. Stay in relationship with me, the one true God. I can fix this. God adds things that weren't there before. Friends, when Ezekiel starts the vision, it's a valley of dry bones. A minute or two later, those bones are covered in flesh and tendons and blood vessels and arteries and a heart. Stuff that wasn't there before, stuff that Ezekiel could never imagine being there. And all he had to do was speak as God instructed him to speak, to see as God asked him to see. You can't see the solution to your problem, but God can. You can't see the pieces he's going to put in place to bring about the solution, but he can. He knows what to do to get you through. Be willing, as Ezekiel was, to see the possibility that God's got this. The things that God adds are necessary things. There's nothing unnecessary going on in this picture. We may not understand it. I doubt Ezekiel had taken a course on anatomy and physiology. I doubt he stood by and thought, good job on that tendon. Yeah, that's exactly where that goes, right? That artery looks great, God. You know, I was going to move it. No, you did good. I don't think he understood exactly what God was doing there. Everything God did, though, was necessary. To bring and restore life. You and I may have no understanding of how God is solving the problem in front of us, but if we watch and wait, if He's fixing it, it's going to turn out okay. Even when we don't understand it, be patient with the one who creates. Amen. And He did it in stages. God did this in stages. Did you notice that? First, Ezekiel has to prophesy to the bones. Hey, Bones, life is coming. Then he has to prophesy to the breath. Wind, breath, spirit. Next. Sometimes we want things now. We want want God to do the speaking, and we want the bones and the flesh and the sinew and everything all at once. Just God microwave. Bing! We are so used to Amazon Prime one-day delivery that for us to wait on a solution to our problems today sometimes just seems like, God, you're so slow. And God's like, you guys are so impatient, right? God did this in stages, and he's going to fix our problems in stages. I want to encourage you to wait on the God who's fixing things. He'll get there. This whole vision is about hope. This whole journey from dry bones in a valley to speaking a prophetic word in agreement with God twice is about restoring hope because God specializes in hope. When our life is a mess, when sin is destroyed, the things that we love when it has taken from us or taken us into captivity, the same God is speaking hope to us. I've got you. Stay with me. The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. And I love it when PowerPoint completely does its own thing on that word. It's because it didn't have the font, I think. The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. 
Friends, this is Jesus in Luke 18, 27. It's a beautiful, beautiful, little tiny one-sentence thought. If you haven't memorized a text in decades, this is a good one. The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Because if you can begin to capture that for yourself, you can begin to believe that the things that you're facing, He'll get you through. That while it's completely impossible for us, He's got it. So what are your very dry bones? What's your valley? What are the things that you're facing? The things that we often face come to mind. Is it our marriage? Our family relationship? The relationships with our parents, or our brothers, or our sisters? Our work or professional relationship? Is it our health or our spiritual life that's dry? Is it the strength to overcome that habit that we've been struggling with for years and it just seems like we have nothing left? It's got us more than we ever have it. Is it the one or the many of all the fruits of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Are we just, are those gone? And if you're wondering if you have and exhibit the fruits of the Spirit, just ask the person that you're driving home with today. They'll let you know. Friends, the Holy Spirit, that breath that Ezekiel was asked to prophesy back into those bodies, that same Holy Spirit wants to work with you in your problem. Whatever your dry bones are, God wants to bring life back into that thing that seems to have disappeared, that very good thing that's supposed to exist, that relationship and put it back together the way it's supposed to be. So again, repeating these two slides, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. I'm going to ask you to say that. Just read that with me. The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Take that with you today. Luke 18, 27. The key word being hope. From dry bones to a mighty army. If God can do that for Ezekiel, what can he do in your life? What are some next steps? First of all, understand that God wants you happy, healthy, and thriving. When you open Genesis 1 and 2 at the beginning, and then you go to Revelation 21 and 22, you find God in relationship with his kids, and they're delighted and happy and alive. There's no pain, there's no suffering, there's no misery anywhere in those two chapters that start and those two chapters that finish. In between is the mess that we know now. And it is a mess. But understand that God's desire for you is that you're in relationship with Him and that that lasts forever. In Ezekiel, this vision of dry bones because the bones are absolutely beyond any help from man in that vision god is showing ezekiel ezekiel we can fix this stay close to me second the next step for you might be that you invite god into your valleys of bones sometimes we've been so beat up or so captive that we've forgotten that there is something possible beyond the condition that we're facing but Ezekiel reminds us, uh, reminds us today that if we invite God into that very problem set, He can fix it. Amen. He's the answer for it. Amen. But He wants an invitation into your valley. He wants the recognition that He is the one that can speak the life back in. He's the one that can recreate. He's a gentleman. He's not going to barge in and tell you, hey, let me do this. He's going to say, may I do this? Invite him. Consider inviting. Maybe your next step. Let, us, let me, let us as a family, invite God into this. Make the decision to do it. Could we partner with God as Ezekiel did? You see, at the start of Ezekiel 37, God could have said, Hey, Ezekiel, you stand there and I'm going to do some stuff over here. You just watch. God could have said, You be quiet and I'll do the talking. But is that how the vision plays out? It's a partnership. 
Ezekiel, God's saying, I need you to prophesy. I need you to speak the words I give you. I need you to partner with me. I'll tell you what to say. You say it, no matter how impossible it seems. So there's a partnership there, and it doesn't happen just once. It happens multiple times. In fact, in that text, we saw three times. Ezekiel, prophesy to the bones. Step one, take it from nothing to something. Ezekiel, prophesy to the breath, to the wind. Now take it from something to something better. Now, Ezekiel, go back and prophesy to my people. Friends, you have a part in restoring life to whatever it is that is lifeless. Now, God, God's going to be the one that instructs you what to do. But He's going to include you in the process of restoring life. Could your next step be to practice patience as God works in stages? Oh boy, is right right? Because we want that instant answer. We want him to just take something away or fix it or speak that word that does it. But so often he works in stages. A little bit here. Now the timing's right. We can go a little bit farther. Now that's okay. Now we can go the next step. So friends, sometimes that instant answer that you and I want, fix her, fix him, fix me, fix that problem. God's going to do it the same way he did with Ezekiel, oftentimes step by step by step. Be patient with him. Just expect that he's moving in the right direction. Could your next step be, and this is where we close today, could your next step be to choose to be one of what God calls my people? My people. I'm going to ask you to do something for me. Just play on the piano for me because I want to make an invitation. I just want to do an appeal. Friends, you and I, anything quietly, anything. Thank you, Lino. You guys know that oftentimes we come and we sit in the church, in the pew. It's the right day. We're hearing the right word. We have the right hope in what God is doing. But sometimes we have never made that decision to be one of God's kids. Now, the invitation is to be one of those that God says, my people. So I just want to invite you, if, if, if you need or want to give your heart to God for the first time, or if you need to rededicate your heart to God to say, wow, I am so full of dry bones and I just want that relationship with you. I would like to invite you to just come to the front today. I want to pray with you and for you. And I'm okay if nobody comes forward because I'm up here all the time by myself anyway. But I want to give you the opportunity to either give your heart to God for the first time or to rededicate your heart to God because you've drifted and into those dry bones I want you to be able to say I see that the God who spoke a word of life for Ezekiel can speak a word of life for me so if you'd like to come forward I'll pray with you and for you just to be able to say dry bones come back together Breath of God, come in. Friends, we thank you for listening today. As the Spirit speaks a word of hope into your life, as God wants to do amazing things for and through you, and as He wants to partner with you. Friends, if you want to come forward, please come forward. And then let's pray together. Let me pray for you and with you. The same God that wants to, the same God that did speak a word of life for Ezekiel is the same exact God that wants to speak a word of hope and life into you today. Anyone else? All right. Let's pray together, friends, as you're coming forward. Gracious Heavenly Father, you are merciful and kind. A vision from Ezekiel, 2,600 years before our own day, gives us hope 
that even today in my life and the lives of the people here can be fixed. The hope that all that we face can be fixed with a relationship with the fixer of great things, the creator of beauty and art. Father, I pray for each of my friends here and those who are listening online that you would keep that prophetic word for them to be the creator of life and the renewer of life in every problem that they're bringing to you. Father, please give them patience as you work in stages. Please help them to see that in you lies the very hope for the solution they've been seeking. Father, we love you. We know we're starting on the journey and we're just broken individuals, but we give ourselves to you this day knowing that you'll fix us that you'll give us the strength and the courage and the patience to walk with you each day. And that's all we have to do, stay next to you. Father, we love you, we thank you, and we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm sorry, please? Sure. Friends, I just want to close in reminding you as well. Pastor Richie Halverson will be speaking tonight at 7.15 at Sarasota Seventh-day Adventist Church. If you want that meal, come at 6.15. If you want the Word of God, come at 7.15. And Richie's going to speak to you more about what it means to have an ongoing relationship with Jesus, to be a busted up, broken up, imperfect human being with a God who specializes in taking those very things and making them incredible works of art. So please, warmly invited to join us tonight. God bless you. Hope you have a wonderful Sabbath.